Welcome to the Happy Mindset. Today's episode is episode number 69, and today's episode title is called Your Difference Makes a Difference. So today I'm joined by Theo Roxon. Theo is a speaker, podcaster, consultant, and writer. He's recently written a book called Your Difference Makes a Difference, which you can find on Amazon. As a speaker, Theo has, re- has speak- spoken four times at TEDx, and he's spoken at the UN as well. On today's episode, he talks about his own journey so far. He talks about some pivotal moments in his, his own life where having a near-death experience was a catalyst for him to, to take his life into his own hands and to create his destiny. He talks as well about cross-cultural communication and how we can do that a bit better, how we can become better active listeners, and how we can overcome some of our cognitive biases as well along the way. So I enjoy talking to, to Theo. He's got a great story, very different mixed background as well at one stage as well he, he had an identity crisis and in, in the episode he talks about how he overcame that how we owned that experience so he had a lot of a lot of stuff going on there and uh it was great to speak to him he's some great insights he's shared and he's doing a lot of great work in the world today so hope you enjoyed today's episode thanks again for listening and i'll see you in the next episode okay so thanks for joining us today tayo Pleasure's mine. No, it's a pleasure to be on here. Uh, I'm looking forward to this conversation. and I love your story. Thanks, man. So my first question for you is, who are you, Theo, and what are you doing in the world today? So I'm a cultural translator and a brand strategist. And what I mean by cultural translator is I essentially help people and institutions effectively connect across cultures. And as a brand strategist, I work with change makers who are interested in, in using the, your uniqueness to to uh, make an impact in the world. And so I help them transform their stories into impact. Uh, but I'm happy to dive into more <laughs> as we yeah. go into the interview. Cultural translator is quite cool. How did that come about? How did you become a cultural translator? Yeah, so it's a term I just coined just because I, uh, you know, personally, I grew up as a Nigerian with, uh, you know, who grew up in five countries and four continents in addition to two military dictatorships in the, in the first nine years of his life. So, all of my life, my formative periods of my life were spent in and out of different cultures. I was trying to figure out my identity in, you know, in in between all these nuance, amongst all these nuance. And as I was doing that, I initially had an identity crisis and that identity crisis really informed the way I saw the world. But after a while, I started to realize that I needed to really claim who I was and it was okay to adapt, not adapt, not just adapt to um, basically accept every aspect of what made me who, you know, I was tired of hearing people say, you're not black enough, you're not man enough, you're not Nigerian enough. And so I just said, you know what, I'm all these things. And there are many people in the world who have sort of grown up thinking that being who they are is not enough. And so I wanted to create a a, a world and reality for people to understand that being who you are is enough. And let's talk about how we can institutionalize that in schools and in workplaces and different places uh, that, you know, inform and shape people's growth. So I started writing and my my writing led to, you know, the podcast, which led to me speaking and consulting. And the more I wrote, the more I shared my stories, the more people would come out of the woodworks and say, hey, you know, I grew up in a similar way. I used to think the same way. I thought I was alone. And all that, you know, led me to you know, create programs and things around that and to really come up with the saying, use your difference to make a difference, which is my mission statement and also the title of the book. And yeah, you know, as a result of that, um, uh, I started doing a lot of diversity and inclusion work and here we are today. That's cool. Sorry. Use your difference to make a difference. Where did that come from? Well, I mean, it it came from all, a lot, a lot of the work that I'm doing, but I was the term specifically, I was writing, this was right after my near-death experience, so in 2012. So I think I started writing um, after that even more. I was writing in high school, but then I started taking it even more seriously after the near-death experience because I was like, well, I better make this <laughs> a, serious, a serious thing. And so maybe a year or two after the, the, the accident, I was writing a blog post about this song that I heard that was really fascinating to me. It was by um, uh, Nico and Vince, Am I Wrong? And there's just two black gentlemen who I had assumed were African-American, but they were from Norway. And I was mad at myself for making that assumption. I was like, well, you're the guy that's about diversity and inclusion and you're making assumptions here because of, uh, um, you know, skin color. And I was like, oh, yeah, I should have just realized that I, could, I should have done more research instead of just making the assumption. But the song and the, the lyrics were basically talking about how 
these two individuals were questioning themselves. Am I wrong for wanting to think outside the box? And it was thinking, it was basically the message of the song was, you're not wrong. You're doing something that's incredible. And I was dissecting the lyrics and turned that into a blog post while also admitting that I had also made an assumption about who they are. And in the process, when I wrote, when I came to the conclusion that I wrote, I think we all need to learn how to use our differences to make a difference. And I hit send, submit, and came back to it maybe a day after. And I kept reading that last line. I was like, wow, that's exactly what it is. It's use your difference to make a difference. And so I extrapolated that line and it became my mission statement from then on. There's, there's two key things there I want to come back to. So the near death experience, what exactly happened there and how did that help you to transform your life? Sure. So the near death experience was August 22, 2012. So I was driving in my Burgundy Toyota Camry at the time. I used to live in, in Virginia. Uh, and I got to the part where the road merged into the highway. I was cruising in my lane, 65 miles an hour, 60 to 65 miles an hour. And then um, as soon as I was cruising in my lane, all of a sudden I noticed that um, a car uh, next to me had lost control. And, you know, the neighboring car lost control. And in the, in the, in the process of, um, you know, making sure that I, I got out of the way, uh, it, it I was swerving out of the way so I wouldn't get hit. But this car had already halved my lane. You know, it came into the half of my lane because New York, <laughs> the ambulance. Um, so, yeah, so this car had already just lost control to the point where my lane was coming to half. So I swerved out of the way so I wouldn't get hit. Smash into left guardrail, boom, right guardrail, boom, one car, boom, two cars, boom, back to left guardrail. And I, I hit the car with such impact that the car was about to flip over the bridge. And while this was happening, a lot of things happened in your head. You know, you, you, the first thought that came to mind was, wow, you're 22 years old, you're about to die. Have you done everything you said you were gonna do? And I had it. I was this kid who was um, impacted and influenced by the late Nelson Mandela and Oprah Winfrey. I wanted to use my cultural backgrounds to bridge culture divides. And here I was in a job I hated about to die at age 22. And then the other thing that happened was your adrenaline would kick in. And so you just sort of act on instinct. And my instinct told me to slam my brakes. So I slammed my brakes. And then, um, and then I somehow managed to get out of the car. And as I got out of the car, my car was completely totaled. Poof, and there were two other cars hit. But nothing happened to me. I was completely unscathed, unharmed, uh, except internally. <laughs> and um, I just took that as a sign. I, I realized that I... I a life can go like this. And so what I did was I shortly quit my job after that. I moved to the near the, the city that I felt the most alive in, which was New York City. And I started to follow my curiosity, which is something that my best friend always says. And I started to follow my curiosity. And my, my curiosities have always been, you know, exploring my creative side. I've, I've been writing since I was 15. I was, why, why didn't I do that more? Why didn't I explore more stories, an investigative path, and just really talk about different cultures. And so while I was getting my MBA, I would basically interview people like you're doing right now who grew up in a similar way and talk about identity and how we can create some safe spaces with people. And all of that led me to start getting noticed in more environments and people would suggest you sp I speak and then it would suggest I do more things. And it, it gave me more confidence in, in my platform. Well, that's cool. So you rekindled your relationship with your curiosity. Was that I did. one of the biggest things? It did. I did. I did. Because I didn't know that. First of all, I didn't even know that you could do anything with my, you know, my curiosity or any career. I didn't know it was a thing. I didn't think anyone cared. <laughs> it's funny. I say my story that people are like, well, not many people grew up like you. But in my head, it was just me. So I, was, I didn't think it was a big deal. My brothers grew up the same. I was like, oh, OK. No, uh, I'm yeah. just this weird, yeah, weird kid. So, yeah. But it was... Um, it was something that what people were relating to because in today's world it's very divisive <laughs> and, and it's defined by a lot of fear and ignorance. And what a lot of what I was talking about was nuance, curiosity, cross-cultural communication, which is what we need today. Mm -hmm. The other thing I just want to go back to is the thinking outside the box. Do you remember getting an interest in thinking outside the box or was it just like something that, that happened? <laughs> Well, thinking outside the box for me has always been something that I, I, you know, I didn't always feel like I had a choice, you know, when, I'm 10 years old and I'm this skinny Nigerian kid with a thick Nigerian accent in a French speaking country and an American national school going through puberty, thinking outside the box is what you have to do to survive. And so, you know, it was just, 
who is a habit of, of by someone that moves around by you know when you move around so much you have to adapt mm -hmm. and so if you want to fit into a different environment or you want to understand something you have to literally learn how to look from a macro and a micro point of view and then see where you fit in and so that involves a lot of creative thinking a lot of trial and error uh and so yeah it's just something i had to do <laughs> did at any point when you're doing that did you start realizing who am i when you could see that you could, you could adapt like a chameleon to different different things yeah yeah i mean that that, that, that was the reason for the identity crisis I, I you know you you lose yourself a little bit because you define yourself by a made-up standard you know, I, I used to think I was not good looking because the standard was Euro Eurocentric, right? People would make fun of my hair or my food or any of that. And so you start to feel bad about yourself or you, how you sound defines whether you're sophisticated or not, uh, you know, all these things. And so I, I had several moments of those back and forth. And when I came back to Nigeria, it was all of a sudden I wasn't Nigerian enough. You know, people would be like, well, you sound different or you're not there. Are you one of us? And so when I was at around 17 and I was graduating from high school, I said to myself that I'm not going to define myself based on other people's standard anymore. I'm going to accept my idiosyncrasies, my eccentricities and understand that that's me and it's okay. You know, I don't need to like acquiesce to anyone else's. Um, and so, yeah, when I, when I got to college, it was, you know, people just learned to accept that this is the guy that's, like love sports as much as he loves romantic movies or likes to be loud or all, you know, he's all over the place with, with his interests, but he's who he is. <laughs> um, but yeah, it was a conscious decision to do that. So yeah, like when you made that conscious decision, were you able to flip it straight away or did it take a bit of time for you to become more comfortable in yourself? Well, I mean, it, it took, I don't know. I don't know if it's ever an initial flip. I made the decision right after graduate, after continuously going through, you know, the, the, the issues of people trying to get you to do something more and more. So I think it was a gradual process. So by the time I was 17, um, I was like, you know, how I, I'm shedding this environment. So when I got into a new environment, which is what happened, I, when I left Nigeria, I, we moved to Vietnam shortly, then, Viet, then, then Virginia. So it's very, no one in Virginia knew who I was before. Mm -hmm. So I was just like, yep, yeah, this is me. <laughs> I'm saying this. And so, I wouldn't say it was an easy transition, but it, I didn't have to worry about someone who knew me before and said, you know, this is what, this is what's happening. I was just, I introduced myself as who I am and I didn't introduce myself as any version of anybody else. It was just a full me. And yeah. so, yeah. Cool. yeah. So like how powerful is the environment around us and how it shapes our personality and what we see in the world from your experience? It's huge. I think our environments impact our biases, our, our, our thoughts and our frames of reference, our worldviews. You know, if we don't investigate all these things, and it's one of the things I talk about in my speeches or in the book, it's in order to learn how to connect effectively across cultures, we have to start within. You know, we have to understand how we see the world and where potential gaps for us exist in terms of learning. But if we don't understand how our biases, our values and our triggers uh, you know, it, 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 we have a very limited perspective of the world. So your environments, you know, your sphere of influence, your parents, your schools, your, 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 you know, your friends, the people you surround yourselves with, the mentors, the books you read, things you watch, all those things play a huge role. If I didn't grow up in those countries, I wouldn't have been able to be more open-minded in, in certain things, you know? Uh, and it was all because I got to see other people do different things in and achieve the same results that I would have done doing doing it a different way. Yeah. So like how do we become better active listeners then? Do we have to get rid of these biases first or like what's the process there <laughs> becoming a better active listener? Well, first of all, we all have biases and our biases yeah. don't necessarily make us bad or, or, or good. It, it, you know, these are protective things that help us see the world. But the thing that we have to be investigative of is when our biases are limiting our definitions of other people. You know, when we're trying to define individuals by a group of people, and then we have to be, we have to understand that this is, is very dangerous because then it can be institutionalized and then you marginalize people. And so I will always, you know, when I, I will always have if people go through this exercise, have people go through who are your three best friends, who are the, where are the last three places you've lived in, and who, um, who are the last three people you've been in relationships with? And then I have them do a very, very deep investigative dive. Like, tell me the personalities of how you bonded, what specifically about um, the, 
you know, the places you lived in, were they rural, were they urban, you know, were they metropolitan, you know, uh, the people you, you're friends with or relationships with, were they, you know, tall, black, dark, green, you know, um, speak languages. And the idea is for everyone to understand why they believe what they believe. You know, if, you, if you've noticed, you ask someone, why do you believe what you believe or why do you believe that? A lot of times they'll tell you, oh, I don't know, I just grew up that way. Or my parents told me. I want people to become more critical thinkers. We need to be more critical thinkers about ourselves. Then you understand your triggers. Uh, what, what environments really trigger you? And why do they trigger you? Is it someone that's condescending? Or is it someone that says something about, I don't know, I'm a Man U fan. So someone that says something about, uh, I guess, Liverpool or, <laughs> or Arsenal. Arsenal is the team I'm not a fan of. <laughs> but <laughs> the most, we're not doing well as Man U anyway. But, but anyways, if I'm, you know, some people it can be sports or something like that. What are the things that trigger you and then why? Understanding that really allows you to really know yourself more. And then you can say, well, you can start to really investigate why those things happen. And then you become more aware of how to react and manage those emotions. And then your values. When you, when you ask anyone what the values are, they'll probably tell you integrity, honesty, all that. But how many times do you actually live out those values? Right? Do you, do you actually live them out? Are they inclusive? Do you only love certain type of people? If you say love is your values, are, are you always honest? <laughs> and, and, and is it, you know, we get into trouble when we stray away from our values. When you start to do that, you would definitely become a more active listener because active listener then becomes listening to understand. It's not listening to confirm. You're not listening to say, well, I just need, I'm just going to ask you a question, but I want you to say the answer I want. You're going to be more curious about uh, what they are. And then the more curious you are, you'll ask open-ended questions instead of leading questions. When you ask open-ended questions, it's, you know, tell, tell me your story about this. Why does this, ex why does this experience, you know, uh, make you feel that way? That invites the other person to tell you their story instead of you assuming their story. And when they tell you their story and their experience, your mind opens. Um, so it, it's all that, uh, but that, that gets you to active listening. Yeah, that's good. I think I think it's really important to to have that skill because it's like otherwise people feel unheard, and when you don't feel heard, you feel misunderstood by the world, and it feels frustrating, and you get angry and stuff. And oh my yeah, gosh, yeah. Really, uh, so how yeah. do we like bring this more into like debate, like where we can actually have critical thinking as part <laughs> to debate rather than trying to argue points and not getting anywhere and getting a loggerheads. Sometimes with debate, I think people forget that uh, you, you have to separate the issue from the person. You know, I've seen, I've noticed people doing, especially in today, whether it's sports or politics or anything, it's the loudest person, I want to interrupt, or, um, you know, they go for character attacks. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and so I, I think whenever we're trying to bring this into debate, we have to, do, whether it's formally and informally, set these rules that say, hey, um, you and I, well, we're going to talk about this issue. We might disagree on this, but let's remember the rules. We're making the environment safe. We're going to have everybody have the opportunity to share their points. Um, and as much as you can, let's limit the interruptions. And then you get to say your point. You get to say my point. And obviously, passion can get involved. But always remember, keep the environment safe and don't attack the person. Attack the issue if that's what you need to do that. Um, and then, um, and, you know, and, and then making sure you give people equal time. Uh, I was watching that democratic debates and I'm not sure that that was <laughs> necessarily, uh, practiced because sometimes you, you just see people jumping over things and that's where you, you find a moderator saying, well, why can we just, let's let this person talk, let's let this person talk. And then you say your, your stuff. So, uh, but it comes down to feeling seen, heard and understood, which is something you pointed out too. If you, if you commit to making sure everybody gets, gets the point heard. And then you paraphrase back to them whenever, before you go on a point and say, hey, just so I get this, before I argue this point, are you saying such and such and such? And they say, yes, yes, yes. Okay, well, here's why I disagree. Da -da 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 -da. And then you do the same thing back and forth. Um, yeah, you know, I think that's more, it's a safer way rather of having yeah, a debate. That's pretty cool. Like, um, you might touch on it there with the foreign, foreign languages, but I even feel within our native language, it's good to translate it into your own words rather than just assuming that this word means this. I just started to see it more in the English language that like, just because a word has got a dictionary definition doesn't mean that that's what they meant exactly by that word. Yeah. Uh, Absolutely. And yeah, you're probably glad. So yeah, so you, you probably see this all the time. There's, I mean, a one word could probably mean something differently in another word. And it's like, oh, wait, no, I, I only said that word because it means this way. Yeah. Or oh, that's how I take that. And so then it becomes like, you Especially if it's a, a triggering word as well, because you exactly. jumped the gun. And, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. 
Oh, well, you, you've been learning foreign languages. What were the advantages you've seen to like learning another language? Well, so for me, the language that I know how to speak other than English is, is French and I just conversation with Spanish. But uh, for me, French, I mean, French is just a beautiful language, but w w with French, it, it's, you start to understand things like tone, <laughs> mm -hmm. pronunciation, uh, or e even even just context, because you know you know sometimes the same word can mean different things, and it's the, you know if you don't listen to it, you could just make the wrong assumption, uh, and and it forces you to pay attention, because then you're you're like wait wait let me I just want to hear what you're saying first you know what did you mean and and a lot of then you think about the pronouns and the all that so you're talking about a man or a woman and 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 it gets even more of that so learning languages has made me more attentive <laughs> mm -hmm. I, I think we, we we live in a world that can be that can promote a lot of distractions and so it's easy to just like to look away and not pay attention but if you look at body language you look at the non-verbals which do say more than uh, the verbals in most situations you become more interested uh, i remember there was a there's a time in in Greece when we got lost. I went on a trip with like I was just back in school, ugh, 2010 maybe, uh, and we went on a school trip, and we had gotten lost, uh, part of this group tour. And me and my friends, we didn't speak Greek, so uh, I mean I spoke French, and then there's some English, and some people could speak Spanish in the group, but we were all trying to talk in a mixture of Spanish, French, French, and sign language. And we found our way back, but we had to really look at what their body language was saying. And they had to do the same with us. That really showed me the importance of just listening. And that wasn't listening with our words. We were just like, okay, what, okay. They're saying this, this, we're pointing here. Their eyes like that. They're nodding. They're shaking their head. That, that's what I've, I've learned with three languages. It's, a, it's just a beautiful thing that allows you to pay attention if you, if you surrender to it. Uh -huh. So yeah, you're looking beyond the words. You're looking at the actual person themselves for understanding. That's yes. that's quite cool. Yeah. The other thing, like you're you're a TEDx speaker. You've given four TED talks. Do you have any advice in somebody who's got like a message to share and having the confidence to share it? Like, what's been your journey been like to do that? So with TEDx and and TED events, they they are very interested in in a big idea, right? So if you have a a big idea about something, or if you have an interesting take on an old idea, uh, then you, you're onto something. But you, you have to be able to make it personal yet universal. So my most popular talk is the art of diplomacy. And what that was, was I, I deconstructed what I learned from my dad as the son of a diplomat, but I applied it to the world in terms of how we can connect across cultures. And now, hey, this is what I learned, but this is how it applies to everyone there. And so uh, the, 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 when I found, what I found with tax applications is it's not necessarily a qualifications that get you disqualified. I mean, even though it does play a role, it often is your idea. Some people might have an idea that's too niche, but they don't translate it into uh, a universal theme. You know, how, how can you do that? I mean, you, you, for example, could talk about using languages to what you've learned from being a polyglot and how it applies to, you know, this course today, <laughs> you know, something like that. And that makes you know, you could apply those abstract concepts and explain it to people. Um, and and it's, it's that ability to do that. Uh, also, yeah, I mean, it, the thing with, with TEDx is it's, it's, you know, maximum 18 minutes. So it's a short talk. You can go up to, you know, you can be five minutes up to 18 minutes. It can be less than five minutes sometimes. So really be tight, you know, make sure you know what your, your, your points are. Don't add any story that you don't need to add. Don't add any example. You don't need to add. Keep everything relevant uh, with that. And also start planning at least six months ahead of time. So, you know, the TEDx website has a bunch of upcoming talks. Uh, TED.com slash TEDx slash events, I think. Something like that. Or just Google TEDx events. And then there'll be a link that shows you all the TEDx events that are happening in any calendar year. You want to start looking, you know, maybe four to six months ahead and then start creating a list of, of TEDx, uh, TEDx that you could qualify for. Uh, and then multiple applications. Don't just apply to one. Apply to multiple uh, and follow up. Follow up. That's, that's how I was able to get my first two. I followed up. So, yeah. That's good advice. Don't fear rejection and follow up. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. How have, you like learned, or how have you learned to simplify the complex looking back on it? on your journey so far the complex <laughs> yeah to simplify um, it into the essence of what like what you want to get across so I, 
I, I'm a nerd. <laughs> I, I like deconstructing and reverse engineering things. So I've always been doing this since I was a kid like, without even me knowing it because uh, I would study leaders and I would just do that. But w- what I always do is I just, uh, I, I start off with what, why did something resonate with me and what did I learn from that? Um, and then I, I look for trends. So if I'm studying, sometimes I do video essays and I'm looking for complex. If I'm studying someone like Nelson Mandela, I will look at his life and I'll look at the things that consistently happened. He kept speaking his truth, consistency. I'll just say, what does keep, what does keep doing something on a consistent basis mean? Uh, on, on a, you know, on a repeated basis, that's consistency. I'll say, okay, consistency. Uh, he, uh, he spoke his truth in, in, in opposition, during times of opposition. Uh, what is that? What emotion does that encourage me? Courage. Okay, consistency and courage. And then when he got out of um, the, you know, the uh, prison, he was able to work with uh, people that sometimes maybe have, maybe have participated in jail in him. Open-mindedness big picture and so i i I, that's what i I will ask myself those questions what does this actually instill in me what does it invoke in me and then i will find the word that goes that goes there and so it you know in that point i could explain nelson mandela's story to anyone who doesn't even is not interested in politics but they could see oh yeah i could do the same sort of thing and so yeah it's really about honoring the emotion (laughs) that i a person that a lesson or something that i am i'm observing you know, in, in, inspires in me. And then um, I, I go with that. I, I, that's how I deconstruct. That's good. So you're looking at like patterns and principles there pretty much. Better way that I said it, better way than I said it. Yeah. So patterns, trends, uh, and principles. Well yeah, that's good. And you can use the same thing for skills development too. I realize with language learning and computer programming, it just simplifies the complex good. Otherwise you can get lost in, in all that. Exactly. Exactly. So how, how about the book? When did you start writing the book and what gave you the motivation to do it? Uh, I've always wanted to write a book since I was a kid. Uh, but I, I, believe, and I believe the catalyst was I was giving a talk to my largest audience um, sometime last year and um, uh, well, the year before. And I, I said, hey, um, it was on how to connect effectively across cultures. And there was a long line, a long line of people waiting in line. And they were asking me questions about the talk and wh- how it could apply to their lives. And I said, why don't I just write a book about this? You know, I've been saying I want to write a book, but let me make this the year of writing the book. And so I went about the process of, of putting together a proposal and then pitching as many people as I could. Uh, eventually, it wound its way to, to Wiley. And um, the process was very interesting because, you know, a lot of times you have to follow up. They weren't responsive initially, all the publishers. Uh, and then once Wiley got there and they agreed, uh, w- uh, with me, I signed a deal in December last year, and then they asked me if I could write the book by uh, March 30th. So, uh, and I said, yeah, sure. I mean, was, I mean, I've had this book in my head. <laughs> and yeah. talking to people, people said that, that was crazy, but I was like, that's fine. <laughs> so I started um, mid-January and I finished it, I think, February 28th. So it took me about five weeks or, or started, yeah, January, of, yeah, something like that. So it took me about five weeks and that's relatively quick for writing the, a book that's uh, 222 pages. I wrote 260 pages initially, but the editor didn't cut it down to about you know, 222. And, um, you know, the, the process for me was pretty much the same way I structure, uh, I do a talk is, you know, you have the message, what do you want the me- message of the book to be? What is the structure of the book going to be? And um, I filled out the body with, with, with the structure. And so I knew what I wanted the book uh, to say, and, I, and I, I knew what the structure was. It was going to be broken down into three parts. And then it was a matter of organizing my research, my personal thoughts, and my um, uh, observations into each of those sections. And was there anything that, like from writing the book, was there anything that you learned about your own life that you hadn't really assimilated before? That's a good question. Anything that I learned from my own life? Um, I learned that I'd always been doing this uh, longer than I thought I was. <laughs> it, it was, uh, which is which is a very funny thing because you know sometimes when I was, I'll tell the story, I, I, my turning point was definitely in the, the car accident, which forced me to to really reevaluate my life. But I'd been thinking this way for a long time. You know, for for a great period of my life, I underestimated the the impact of growing up in two military dictatorships. That was the first nine years of my life. You know, it was normalized to me. So. I just, what was what I was born into. I didn't, you know, I wasn't, 
I, I wouldn't even like really think of it too much. I'd be like, yeah, I mean, unfortunately this happened, this, you know, this person, uh, we, we experience all these, these tragedies and it just becomes normalized when you grow up in that environment because that was all I knew. But as I was writing the book and I was reflecting, I started to see that the, the seeds were planted way early on. That was why I was impacted by injustice because I grew up in injustice <laughs> and I would see it on the TV and even the way that people w- would just go about it casually, I think on some level it made me feel like I could do more. You know, there was a dearth of hope. You know, people were losing hope. And so I wanted to inspire hope in some people. But um, yeah, I mean, it, 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 that was really what I, I learned the most. It was, you know, some people say nature versus nurture. I think I was, I guess I was always naturally <laughs> uh, inclined to action. But um, yeah, that was my uh, discovery. Was there ever a point in your life where you felt like you lost hope? Yeah. Yeah, I lo- I mean, before the accident, I was stuck in a job, um, you know, because I'm, you know, you know, I'm not a citizen. So the things in America is you either get married, you get a job or you go to school. And so when I graduated, I got a company to, to sponsor me, but it wasn't a job I had ever imagined doing. You know, I thought I was, you know, I was, thought I was going to be like, you know, making an impact in the world on a global level. And I applied to over 85 jobs and they all said no. Uh, and so then I was like, okay, let me go to other people that gave me internships before. <laughs> and then one of them said, sure, we'll give you a job on social media. We see you have a good social media following. This was back when Twitter was still a new thing. And I was like, okay, I guess I'm going to do social media. I, I got a degree in marketing, so it works. And so um, within you know a few weeks of getting the job, they switched my role on me and I became a salesman and I had to have a quarter of $10,000 to make. And it was, ne- you know, it was no orientation and it was barely it was nothing i'd ever imagined myself doing but then i found myself saying well at least they're giving you a visa at least you can stay here and so i would just stretch out the hours you go to a job and then you stretch two hour job to eight hours and you come back and you just get into this routine mundane life and um yeah i was just i just like i guess it's not gonna happen for me (laughs) and then the accident happened and then i really felt um uh you know re-energized but yeah, I, I, I yeah, <laughs> I thought I wasn't going to be able to do anything. I didn't think my writing mattered. I didn't think anything that I, in my mind, I tried 85 times. So what was the point? So, mm-hmm. yeah. Well, that's interesting. So you kind of given up hope around that time and then that was a catalyst to yeah. move you forward again. It did. And, and it's not like it was smooth sailing because I've gotten, I've gotten, after that, I got fired twice. I had multiple, uh, you know, I was broke multiple times, you know, living in New York as well. But I always had a weird sense of faith and I just had this purpose that I doesn't matter. This is just a season. <laughs> um, and, and, and it, it was interesting how your mindset shifts because if I, if this had happened before the accident, I just would have, you know, taken whatever was available, but I, I knew what I wanted. And so I, I was able to stick through those moments and I could see the bigger picture in the end. Hmm. And was there any, like, is there any questions or any, any kind of questions that stand out in your mind whenever you go through like a, a bad patch? It helps you to recalibrate and focus again. Remember why you're doing this. It's always that thin. And then when you remember why you're doing it, why, why, you know, find the why behind the why. Uh, be, be, because there, there's a reason. I mean, it's people, people will say, well, you know, you have an MBA, you have this, you could easily be doing this job. And I remember why. There are so many people in the world who don't have a voice, who don't have access to more opportunities, who don't even know that there could be a better life for them. You're given a position to have the ability to communicate, to, to be a bridge, be that person. And I, I, that usually is enough for me to recalibrate. You know, I, I, once, once I understand that I'm doing this for not just myself, but for someone, for a community of people, you know, my Angela once said, I don't stand as one, I stand as one as 10,000. I'm butchering the quote, but understanding the significance of, of, of what it is that you're trying to do is so important. So, yeah. Mm-hmm. When did you start seeing the community you're supporting, the, the, the voice you're being, the, or the, when did you start seeing faces to the voices that you're, to the voice you're being? Um, well, it was right after my first, I think I just finished my first year of my MBA and I started a podcast around um, 2014. So I've been doing that since 2014. Yeah, five years, uh, five almost five and a half years now. So, uh, actually five years. So uh, August, August, 2014, I launched a podcast and then, um, 
I, I basically, I'd found, I just found this term, discover this term, it's called third culture kids. And at the time, and I was reading a Buzzfeed article, it was like 31 signs, you're a third culture kid. And for those that don't know what that is, it's a term that refers to the people that spent the formative periods of their lives outside of the parents' cultures. So diplomatic kids, army brats, military, you know, missionary kids, everything. And so I just found myself not into all the things, you know, you think in different time zones, your food, you know, people will say all these things about your names and all these things. And I was like, why don't I create a podcast for this community? You know, I, you know, there's a community that exists across here. And so I, I looked up the hashtag third culture kid and hashtag TCK. That's the acronym. And I joined all the third culture kid groups that I could find on Facebook and LinkedIn. I just started writing and providing value for that content, for that group. And you're saying, Hey, you know, like you, I didn't even have to explain myself. You're like, Oh yeah, we understand. And like, this is how you can get a job. This is how you can embrace a day. This is how you can deal with all these things. And all the, and based on that, you get feedback and, you know, based on, you know, people ask for more questions and I will turn that into more uh, blog posts. And, you know, I, I eventually said, I'm going to do a podcast. And then people started saying, yeah, we really like what you've been doing over the past few weeks, uh, months, and I would love to share my story. It's so amazing that you're creating a platform for people like us to say something like that. And the insight that that gave me was people just wanted to tell their stories. <laughs> mm -hmm. And so understanding that and really getting other people to do the same, I started to get emails from people saying, you know, you don't know me. I, I heard about you from someone else. Someone recommended this, but this guest really touched me. Your story really touched me. and um, those emails kept me going through those moments uh, that I had doubts for sure. That's good. That's, that's great stuff. So do you have any uh, final message before we, we go today, Theo? Um, no, I mean, the, the number one message is I always say use your difference to make a difference. But I think we're, what I mean by that is, I'm not, I think I know what I mean by that is by we need to change our relationships with how we approach things that are different from us. Right. Many, if you look out through, if you look throughout history, Every time we've had an adverse relationship with something that's different, it's resulted into some devastating thing. War, sexism, racism, anything. It's a different religion, different gender, different this. And then we, we don't know how to handle that. And so we think it's an attack on us. And so I want to invite people to really reevaluate what, they, what their relationship with different people are, different things are. You don't have to agree, but you don't have to victimize all the time i mean it, some things are worth victimizing but not all things are and so just um recontextualizing and really evaluating all those things uh would be the, the word that i say and then um yeah reflect on your biases you might be surprised with what you learn yeah i'm always surprised what i learn yeah, yeah. so where where would these guys find you online and where can we find the book all right the book is everywhere books are sold it's called use your difference to make a difference i need all of you to buy it to, to share with your friends christmas is coming around the corner all the holidays are coming around the corner depending on your your religion you know you know anything any holidays we have holidays in the fall and then in, 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 in the winter just share with your friends uh amazon barnes and nobles anywhere books are sold online uh as well and um my you can find me at tyroxin.com t-a-y-o-r-o-c-k-s-o-n.com or at tyroxin anywhere on social media Great. Thanks. Thanks, Theo. So yeah, it was great talking to you today and hearing your story and how you followed your curiosity in, in the midst of adversity and how you've built a platform today to inspire other people just like you. So thanks again for, for sharing, Theo. Well, thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. Cool. So until next time, have fun and enjoy the process. All right.